if you are part of a church, and especially if you're part of uh, a hierarchical church. I don't know. Let me see if I can think of one. Like maybe, for example, the Episcopal Church. Uh, you, you might start to worry when Jesus starts talking about authority. The only thing that could be worse than being an Episcopalian and hearing Jesus talking about authority is, if you can imagine it, hypothetically, of course, if a person actually had a position of authority in a, hier in a hierarchical church, that person might hypothetically be especially concerned when Jesus gets into a heated dispute about authority with the chief priests in the temple. Especially when Jesus scores a theoretical, excuse me, especially when Jesus scores a rhetorical knockout and drops the mic. Now, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I believe in the value of hierarchy in the church, but it has a pitfall, probably has many. But one pitfall is that while the images of hierarchy that we uphold in the church are supposed to expand our mind to think to be drawn into God's supreme authority, the actual practice of hierarchy can narrow our consciousness down to where we think, to where we think only of bureaucracy. It's not incidental that the exchange between Jesus and these religious authorities takes place in the temple. The temple of all places is the place where they have authority. And if you can't have authority over heaven and earth, then having authority over a nice big building is not a bad consolation prize. <laughs> Many of you uh, who are with us this morning will remember a service of prayer that took place at St. Paul's uh, on the 11th of August in 2017. We had hundreds of people, uh, hundreds of people uh, joining in prayer uh, in preparation for the Unite the Right rally. Uh, the next day in preparation to uh, to stand in a lot in a variety of ways but to stand in conscience um, in opposition to that message of hatred and uh, there were a lot of people in the building who were not particularly interested in the hierarchy of the Episcopal Church uh, and there were a lot of people who were involved in organizing the event uh, in which the Holy Spirit was moving who had exactly no interest in the hierarchy of the Episcopal Church and so a dispute arose on the steps outside St. Paul's about who would be let in, where they would sit, how many people we could have inside. Uh, and I had made a decision as the rector and somebody who was managing the door got that message in a roundabout way. And I heard him say to somebody standing there, well, who's this coming from? Where's this coming from? And I said, it's coming from me and it's my building. <laughs> I have the authority. That is exactly the ground on which the chief priests and the elders want to have this dispute with Jesus. They want to have a dispute over who has authority over this building, what takes place here, and who's in charge. That's not the discussion that interests Jesus. To figure out where Jesus wants to focus this discussion, we have to look back through the gospel a little bit, find some of the things that he refers to in his answer. One of which is John the Baptist. He tells the chief priests and the elders, you, you didn't listen to John the Baptist. You saw and you still didn't change your mind. So what is it that John the Baptist said? He's such an enormous character in the gospels but he, his message is pretty, pretty brief. Uh, it doesn't take more than a couple of paragraphs, much of it repeated, um, to tell us what John the Baptist said. He said, repent, repent. Well, if somebody comes to me and acts like they have authority and tells me to repent, frankly, most days, I'd rather be arguing about the building. Repent, it's a difficult one to hear and take in. The other thing John the Baptist says is, the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom, and we forget how loaded a term that is. Wait, what kingdom? Who's the king? Who's the king? What kingdom? That is a threat to peace and stability, to talk about some other kingdom coming near. 
In fact, right before we get to this uh, exchange we had in this morning's gospel, uh, Jesus is at the temple. The lame and the blind are coming to him, and children cry out at the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. Whoa! Son of David is a king, a king who will displace the king who rules there now, according to the hierarchy of bureaucracy. So the authority is being called into question. The authority with which John speaks is simply the authority of truth. And Jesus comes back to this also in the Gospels. He tells us, uh, he tells us that observations, observations are trustworthy. And he trusts that the chief priests and the elders have observed the same things that those children observed. They have observed the blind and the lame being healed. And yet, even after you saw it, you did not change your minds. So Jesus is not asking us, as, as, uh, as, as much of our popular discourse about religion would have us believe, he is not asking us uh, to believe in in wildly impossible things that we cannot observe, his, his, his exhortation to us always comes back to seeing and hearing. In fact, when John is in prison and John tells, uh, John sends his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one? Are you the one who is coming? Jesus doesn't send a secret message back. He sends John's disciples away saying, tell John what you see and hear healing, reconciliation. What do you see in here? Trust what you see in here. So that's part of the message. That's part of where Jesus wants this conversation to take place because he knows that these temple authorities have seen this. They just can't bring it on board uh, with their attachment to their own authority. The other thing that comes up in Jesus's response this morning is the vineyard. Now, this is the second week in a row we've heard about the vineyard and people working in the vineyard. And last week, it was about long hours in the vineyard and scorching sun. So work in the vineyard sounds difficult. At first glance, this morning's passage almost seems like it's disconnected. It almost seems like for, it's two parts. One, you have Jesus at the temple uh, disputing with the chief priests and the elders. And then you have this parable about the vineyard, uh, as if we just didn't have enough weeks to, you know, separate these two gospel readings out, so we mashed them together. But in fact, the story, the parable, is Jesus' answer to the chief priests uh, and the elders. This, this, the parable he tells is, is his answer, because he tells the story of, uh, of the two who are, uh, who are called to work in the vineyard. One says, yes and then goes and does something else. The other says no, and then goes and serves. So the, the clear implication for the, the chief priests and the elders is that they have told God, they have said to God, yes, yes, we will work in the vineyard. Uh, but what they're doing is not working in the vineyard. Is it because they're lazy? I don't think so. Because the work in the vineyard doesn't seem to be that onerous. And why do we know this? Again, let's look again at one of the things that, the, the third thing that Jesus refers to. He talks about John the Baptist in this parable. He talks about the vineyard and he talks about the tax collectors and prostitutes. And he tells these chief priests and elders, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into, uh, going into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. They listened and believed John the Baptist. And so if you just read this passage, you might conclude that if you had the time and the interest, you'd go back in the gospel and find the tax collectors and the prostitutes out there working hard in the vineyard. You'd find them out there participating with Jesus and doing all this difficult, onerous work, the scorching sun and the long hours. You won't find it. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are not that prominent. They have an important role in this story but it's not one of working laboriously for long hours. The place where the tax collectors and the prostitutes have come up is in Jesus's response in an earlier dis disputation when he says to the, to the critics, you know, John, John came and he didn't, 
he was he was an ascetic. He didn't he didn't go to parties. He didn't drink. He uh, he didn't go to feasts. And and you didn't believe him. And you you dismissed him and his message. And then Jesus comes along, and the knock on him is this guy eats with sinners and tax collectors. We can't listen to him. He eats and drinks with sinners and tax collectors. That's really, that's where they appear. That's the appearance that they make in the gospel before Jesus says they are going into the kingdom of heaven before the chief priests and the elders. What if the work, what if the work of the vineyard is no more onerous than eating and drinking, sharing life, sharing communion with God in Christ, telling the truth, drawing near to the truth, celebrating the truth rather than defending against the truth because it challenges one's own authority. The tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes did not have any vaunted sense of their own authority over the matters of heaven and earth. And yet Jesus affirms that they have been working in the vineyard because they believed in what John said. John said, the kingdom of heaven has come near. They saw it and they trusted their own eyes. Amen.